Church family, I'm Bronwyn. Happy Mother's Day and welcome to our online service. Today we're finishing our series, The Book of Revelation, with a message from Pastor John. But first, I want to share what's coming up in the life of our church. Church, mark your calendars because we have our annual celebration and barbecue coming up next month, June 2nd, from 12 to 2, right outside in our patio after the service. Come and celebrate a great year with your church family by enjoying food together, fellowship with one another, jumping on the bounce house, and having a great time. We'll provide food, including a snow cone machine and a cotton candy machine, games, some tables, and if you want to, bring a lawn chair or blanket to enjoy your food picnic style. We also have many opportunities for you to help make this celebration awesome. You can sign up to volunteer and find all the information you need at ucov.com forward slash annual celebration. Also, Breakaway, our kids' summer day camp, is less than two months away, oh my goodness, and there are still many ways for you to get involved. Like you heard last week, we're still looking for a few more security team members, and we are also looking for small group leaders. Small group leaders get to engage with our campers at the closest level. Small group leaders get to lead them through their day, hear the campers' perspectives, hang out during small group time, go on the slip inside with them, and have lots of fun. If you'd like to sign up for any of these roles, go to ucov.com forward slash breakaway. We'd love to have you. Finally, again, I want to say a very happy Mother's Day to all the moms, grandmas, moms-to-be, and anyone serving in that maternal role for another person. Thank you for what you do. Today, we celebrate the women who've watched over us, taken care of us, and walked us through life. It's a day to say thank you to every mom. Moms with children running through the house. And moms whose kids are all grown up. Moms who are walking this road all by themselves. And moms who've loved a child in need. Moms who've suffered terrible loss. And moms whose children have become moms themselves. For all the times your love made our lives better, and the moments your lessons made our paths clear. For the way you showed us Jesus by simply being yourself. We say thank you. Whether today is a day of celebration, reflection, or heartache, know that you are loved. Mom, this day is for you. Happy Mother's Day. Now, as we continue our service, will you please join me in prayer? God, thank you uh, for today. God, thank you that we could uh, celebrate moms, that we could celebrate uh, moms-to-be, we could celebrate foster moms, we could celebrate uh, people who've stepped in the place um, to be a mom to someone. God, thank you um, for your love and care that comes through um, those folks. God, and thank you that even though these moms love us with their whole heart, that we know that you love us even more than that. And that's almost unfathomable, God. But thank you for your great love for us. Amen. Parker, you forgot to introduce your folks. Where are they? Oh, there they are. Doug and, yeah, sorry. Doug and Rachel Parker. Uh, Johnston are here, so welcome them. And then we also have Greg Yee. Can you stand up, Greg? Sorry. I'm, I'm embarrassing all these people. Hey, you guys, Greg is a superintendent of our denomination in the northern western, northwestern side of our denomination, and he's a good friend as well. So welcome, you guys. So I have a... 
and on. So we get to finish Revelation, you guys. So that, you no, know, you're supposed to be sad. Like this is the word. No, we get to finish Revelation. So I have the easiest thing for you to look up in your Bible. It's Revelation chapter 22, verse 6. So if you are not familiar with the Bible, just go to the end. And you get to, we get to read almost the whole last chapter. If you're new to our church, we have spent 30 weeks in this book, and you are in week number 30. We are finishing up. It's the last time you're going to see that sermon bumper. Sorry, yeah. Uh, but all these things are changing, but I'm really excited about what God is going to be doing. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to read this last section. I'm going to ask for permission. We're going to read it. I'm going to comment a little bit about it, but really I want to spend most of the time, if not almost all the time, talking about why I'm so glad we got to go through the book of Revelation together. And if you ever take a preaching class, they really encourage you to, they encourage you to limit the number of points because the more points you have, the less we remember. Well, I'm disregarding that advice because I have 11 points for you today. And because of that, you'll remember none of it. So at the end of this, I'm going to ask you to focus on one or two points. So as we go through these, just ask God, are you speaking to me through this point? And I'll ask you to focus on that one, and we will believe that God will work nonetheless. Amen? Revelation chapter 22, verse 6. By the way, you'll notice our lights are a little down today. Uh, I want to just give a lot of thanks. We have a lot of volunteers who put in a new lighting system for this area in preparation for our summer camp called Breakaway. Uh, we have uh, 350 kids, over 200 volunteers, and we're trying to make this room very fun. So there will be a lot more lights going on, but they can't get them working today. So that's why it's a little dark today. That's what's going on. Sound good? All right. So Revelation chapter 22, verse 6. The angel said to me, now, this is John speaking. We believe it's the disciple of Jesus. And this angel is the one we saw all the way in chapter 1 who revealed this vision to John. So now we're closing out. This angel is now speaking to John and says, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants, that's you and me, the things that soon must take place. And then we hear Jesus speaking, look, I am coming soon. Blessed, fortunate, lucky is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. Now I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. Now, just really quick, notice that John says, I am the one who heard and saw these things. The book of Revelation is an audio visual book. It's meant to stimulate our senses of hearing and visuals. And John is writing them all down, what he is hearing and what he is seeing on his scroll. After he finished his writing, he says, I fell down at the feet of the angel who had revealed all this to me. And then in verse 9, this angel said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keeps the word of this scroll. Worship God. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll that you've been writing because the time is near. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do what is right, and let the holy person continue to be holy. Here the angel is saying, look, the line has been drawn in the sand. Choose which way you're going to go in response to this prophecy. Then Jesus speaks, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning, and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, this idea of being forgiven and purified by God, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates of the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride, that's us, say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of the scroll 
If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in the scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of the prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in the scroll. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. And this book ends with a word. Let's say it together. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I am so glad we went through this book. And if you were here when we first started, I was really honest. I've been preaching for 26 years, and I have never, ever, ever wanted to preach this book. I, I was scared of it. I avoided it. I didn't know how to preach with it. And, 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 and just a few things happened in a row that made this a real possibility. And I am so glad we did. I want to share 11 reasons why I'm glad. And you'll have to keep... Uh, help me keep track of my 11 points because even I get lost. You guys ready? Number one is it's a reminder that all scripture is from God. All scripture is from God. Let's just name it. There are parts of God's word that are easy to read, that are clear, that feel so good for our soul, that are helpful. And we like to stick with the parts of scripture that are easiest and most understandable and most hopeful. The flip side is we like to avoid the parts of Scripture that are hard to understand, that might seem harsh or heavy, and we tend to avoid that. But I have found that even in the hard parts of Scripture, if you take the time to dive deeply, to ask the hard questions, to not be afraid of expressing your anger and doubt towards towards God with that Scripture, if you keep pushing through, what tends to happen is God, through His Spirit, shows you something through that that you have never seen before that's refreshing and rewarding and good for your soul. And I have found that's true with the book of Revelation. Brothers and sisters, I am so glad we went through this, even the hard parts, because I believe we saw something about Jesus that we would never have seen had we not taken the hard step of going through this book. As you guys know, 2 Corinthians 3.16 says, all scripture is God-breathed, all scripture. It's useful for teaching and rebuking. It's useful for correcting our thoughts and for correcting and training in righteousness, to shaping our behavior. Why? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I am hoping that in your own personal devotions, when you hit hard scriptures, that you don't talk it away like, oh, maybe this wasn't inspired, or that was just back then, but you would actually say, God, you have this in your word. Why? Why do you have it? And even if you don't like it, tell God you don't like it. Tell him why, and keep pushing in. And it may not be that day, but I have found if you keep pushing in, God does speak through his word. And some of the most powerful parts of scripture for me are the ones that were hardest to get through. So I pray that you see that even the book of Revelation is inspired. And I'm so glad we went through this to, to, to honor our value that all scripture is God-breathed. Amen? Number two is this, is that we get to see Jesus as he is today. We get to see Jesus as, we is, as he is today. Now, most of the time when we study the life of Jesus, we look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, absolutely appropriate. These are the biographies of Jesus that eyewitnesses or people close to eyewitnesses have shared what Jesus is like. But we forget that Jesus has died and he's resurrected and now he is with God in heaven and we forget that there is a picture of Jesus in the here and now that we don't pay attention to. The book of Revelation lets us see a new picture of Jesus of what he's like today, how he's active now. Remember, the author of Revelation most likely was the disciple John. John spent three full-time years ministering alongside Jesus. If anyone knows Jesus, it would have been one of the 12 disciples of whom John is. And when he saw Jesus for the first time in this Revelation in chapter 1, he was overwhelmed. He said, I almost passed out. I was like a dead person at Jesus' feet. And I wonder sometimes if we have domesticated Jesus a little bit and made him palatable for us. But when John saw Jesus, he was overwhelmed with awe and fear because Jesus was glorified and powerful. And so one thing that Revelation does is it helps us see what Jesus is up to today. Certainly he is the Jesus of the Gospels. Of course that's true. And He's the Jesus in heaven right now. And he is a glorified person living at the right hand of God the Father, actively 
involved in our world. And we need to know that, Jesus, too. Would you agree? And Revelation shows us that picture. I remember when I was a a, a campus minister at San Francisco State University, God opened a door for me to lead a Bible study with the wrestling team. In case you have any high value of my athleticism, just tear it down. It was not at all. It was just a door that God opened. And one of the guys in our study was the two-time NCAA uh, Division II champion uh, in his weight class, this big dude. And, And I would, you know, I'd hang out with him a lot, but when I was talking to strangers or people who didn't know him, his name was Mo, everything in me wanted to share, do you know who this is? This is the two-time heavy, I mean, he's a big deal, but he was so humble, he never came across that way. And I had this feeling that the book of Revelation is trying to say, do you know who Jesus is? Do you have any idea? Because when you get to know who he is, you will fall at his feet. So this idea that Revelation is the great revealer. Remember, the first Two words in this book are revelation, well, three words. Revelation, Jesus Christ. And the word revelation means to pull back the curtain, to see what's behind the scenes. And ultimately, the book of Revelation is, I want you to see what Jesus is really like today. So many times, revelation is seen as this prophetic end times, predicting events type of book, but that was not the main purpose. The main purpose was so that you and I could see what Jesus is really like today that he is revealed. Amen? I'm going to say amen after every point, and you just have to help me by saying it back. In fact, actually, let me stay on point number two here. Jesus has given a lot of names in this book. Just Let me just read them through. The faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. He was the first resurrected in the resurrection body. The ruler of the kings of the earth, the Lord of lords, the king of kings. Let me just rephrase that. The ruler of all the presidents of the earth the Lord of all the presidents, the kings of all world rulers. He's king of all world rulers. He's the son of man, the son of God, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, Messiah, Christ, the bright morning star, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He has named all these things. He is Jesus. And if anything, I am so glad we got to see more of who Jesus is. Here's number three that you would know that Jesus is on the throne. The book of Revelation was written during a time where the churches of Jesus Christ, it was around 80 or 90 AD, had just gone through severe martyrdom. Just for saying you were a Christian and not worshiping the empire got you killed. They didn't know it, but another season was coming where they're gonna go through another wave of martyrdom. They're in between two difficult seasons. And there's this temptation of, hey, it looks like the easier way to live in this season is to just not worship Jesus. The book of Revelation, God revealed this to his people, his church, to say, hey, in the midst of all the craziness you're experiencing, can I pull back the curtain of heaven to show you what's going on? And the first thing that John sees is, there's a throne in heaven, and someone is on it. I can't tell you a number of times where we see world events, we see crisis happening in the world, just like today. We experience how hard it is to be a faithful follower of Jesus, and it's so tempting to just compromise, just to domesticate our faith so we don't get in trouble. Jesus is trying to say, hey, in the midst of all the chaos you're experiencing, I'm still on the throne. You stressed about school, you stressed about a relationship, You're wondering about job and finances. You're wondering how it's all going to work out. Your kids are driving you crazy. Your parents are driving you crazy. What is going on? Jesus says, I'm on the throne. Yes, this is painful. Yes, I'm with you. But no, there is some redemptive picture that I want to show you. I'm on the throne. And so it's a chance for us to know that in the midst of all our craziness and everything that we're experiencing, it seems like, God, this is just awful. This is just hurtful. This is just horrible. I am spread thin. I am overwhelmed. I don't know what's going to happen. Jesus says, let me show you what's in the heavens. I'm currently on the throne at work doing something. This doesn't mean we're not affected by world events. It just means that we have a perspective that goes above it all. That we can actually go, this is hard, and yet I know what is true. This is painful, and yet I know what is true. The worst thing to do to a little kid at nighttime is to read a fairy tale to them and stop halfway through. Because it's awful in the middle. Mary doesn't have her little lamb. The pigs have no home. 
It's an awful thing to do. And yet we tend to judge life by the middle chapter. And Jesus is saying, look, do you know what the end chapter is? I'm in control. There is a redemptive purpose. Revelation shows that Jesus is on the throne today. Number four. That we would understand how Jesus wins in this world. And it's a huge paradox. He is the Lion of Judah with all power who became a slain lamb. And that image of the slain lamb is the one thing that goes throughout all Revelation. He is the slain lamb. Jesus was referred to a lamb in the New Testament 39 t- sorry, 34 times. 29 of those times happens in the book of Revelation. It's the primary image. And he's a slain lamb. It's like he's carrying the scars of his sacrifice. And what that means is the way he wins in human history is he looked at those who were persecuting him, took on the injury that they caused, took it on himself, died for it, and looked right at them and said, I love you, and I'm willing to take it on for your sake. Jesus took on the sins of the world when they were aimed at him and took them on, died for it, and loved them anyway. This is the good news of the gospel, that you and I are sinners, that we put Jesus on the cross because of our sins, and he chose to take it on joyfully and loves us and forgives us. Amen? And that was his victory. When John was told, look who's on the throne, it's the Lion of Judah, he turned and he's surprised because what he sees is a lamb that looked like it was just killed. And that's the victor throughout the book of Revelation. That Jesus is counterintuitively winning over the world through taking on a cross and loving those who have tried to harm him. And number five is this, that that has implications for you and me. That the way we're going to be victorious in the world is paradoxical. It means that we rest in our identity in Christ, that we willingly take on the suffering that results from being a believer, and that we love those who cause the harm against us. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you too must take up your cross. And one of the things that comes out throughout the book of Revelation is that the way God's kingdom comes is not through military might, is not through political power, but it's through modeling what Jesus has done, that people rest in their identity of what Christ has done for them, that they're not afraid to share their story with Jesus, that they understand that when they do that, there will be pushback and suffering, that they willingly take on the suffering and love the people who have caused the suffering. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit works. This is a good corrective, you guys. So many times we look at our nation, we think, where is it going? And we begin to think, how can we put on might? How can we use strength to overcome, to bring back what we want to bring back, or to see what we want to see, or to to see righteousness where it's gone, or to push back oppression? And Jesus' method is, ah, you take on the oppression, and you love those who are causing it, and you want the best for them. Ouch! And yet that's the way of the cross. That's the way of the cross. This is really hard right now. Because in our culture, everything is about individual rights, making sure your voice is heard. Jesus took a different approach. He didn't let himself be a, 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 a doormat. He didn't let, and this, just don't hear me wrong. If you're in any type of abusive relationship, it is biblical to remove yourself and be in a safe place. We're not saying that. But we're saying that even when you're in an abusive situation, when you've found that safety for yourself, even when you have a horrendous boss, even when you have a friend who's spoken behind your back, even if you have a spouse who's not treating you well, even if you have a parent or a kid who's not, when those things are going, it's not that you say, hey, keep hurting me. You find your spot, but at the same time, you're saying, okay, God, how do I take this on? Because this is what you did for me. How do I love the person who's doing this for me? And how do I wish them well? This is crazy. And yet, it's how there's victory. An example we see of this is the book of Daniel. Remember, Daniel was was taken from his homeland, was re-educated in the political system of the Babylonians. His, His faith was ridiculed. And yet, 
He kept wanting the best for King Nebuchadnezzar, the same guy who persecuted him. He's like, I want God to spare you. And we see that in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar came alive to Christ. He saw something in Daniel that was powerful. Brothers and sisters, who's causing you harm right now? Who's hurting you? Who in your natural ways you would just want ill for? Can you take up your cross with me and follow the teachings of Jesus? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Amen? That's what it means to take up the cross. And Jesus shows in the book of Revelation that was his method of operation throughout. When he went to battle, he went as a slain lamb. When he had his followers behind him, they weren't wearing armor. They were wearing white robes because they were resting in the identity of Christ. The victory is won through laying down your life for your enemies. Number six. All this is kind of related, but that you would understand the importance of sharing your story with Jesus. That you would understand the importance of sharing your story with Jesus. Over and over again, the book of Revelation, the reason that followers of Jesus were persecuted was because of the simple word testimony. They kept sharing their story of Jesus. And there was consequence as a result. That word testimony and the word witness are the same Greek word. You guys remember what the Greek word is? Martyr. There was just an understanding that if you're going to share and be open about sharing what Christ has done for you, there will be suffering for that. And back then, the days of Revelation, they were so scared. They realized, if I share about Jesus, I might lose my job, I might lose my family, I might be imprisoned, I might be killed, I will probably be ostracized, and they were so scared, as we are in our day. And the message of Revelation was, it's worth the cost. It's worth it. Take on the suffering. It's worth it. People need to hear about Jesus. And when you do that, and when you do it in a town like ours, you will get pushback, but it's worth it. I said this in a previous sermon, you don't need to be weird. You know, there's sometimes we get pushed back because we're just weird, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about just being a normal person and sharing in a normal way what Christ has done for you. Someone in your workplace is suffering. You say, you know, normally I pray. Can I pray for you? Or I've been in that situation before. Oh, can I tell you what I did last week in my Bible study? We just share our lives and we're not afraid of pushing that part of our lives down. And we let God do the work. What you're going to find is that some people will come to know Jesus through your testimony. And some will push back. But Jesus says, it's worth it. The suffering is worth it. And throughout Revelation, we have people who are suffering just for sharing their testimony. And the common phrase, the common theme is, keep going. Don't quit. It's worth it. It seems like in Revelation, the way that God brings about his kingdom is through us not being afraid to share what he has done in our lives. And that somehow, in a way that we don't understand through his spirit, his kingdom comes through that. Number seven. Some of these are repetitive, but hold on. They each have points. One, this number seven is this, that you should not be surprised when when his kingdom moves forward that there's resistance. That when we see God's will being done, we can expect some resistance in that. It's so interesting that some of the plagues and some of the pushback happen as a result of God's kingdom moving forward. Sometimes we're confused because we see God doing great things in our world, and then we see huge pushback. We're going, why? This is good. Jesus says, hey, you've got to expect that. When my kingdom moves forward, there will be pushback. Expect it. Don't be afraid of that. We are in a spiritual battle. There is an enemy who wants to discourage us. So expect pushback. That's the norm, not the exception. It's part of being a follower of Jesus. There's always going to be pushback. Number eight is this. Oh, this one's going to get me in trouble. Here we go. One of your greatest, let me rephrase it this way. What comes out through Revelation is that all of us were created to be worshipers. And if we don't worship God, we will worship something else. You with me? All of us, you and I are created, and if we don't worship God, what shows in Revelation is that one of the number one temptations of what we're going to be tempted to worship is political empire. It's described as a beast. 
And this beast wants your worship. In scripture, the revelation, it says that people worship this entity, this political empire, for one of two reasons. Either they're afraid of it, gosh, if I go against this empire, I'm in trouble, or they're attracted to it, described as a prostitute. And brothers and sisters, let me just say, that is so true today. We are in a political year. We're in political election year this year. Woohoo! I'm not excited at all. Here's what I want to warn us against. First of all, let me just give some caveats. Many of you are involved politically, working for the government, working for the state. I know there are campaign managers, lawyers. Thank you. Some of you are military. Thank you for doing your civic duty. We are citizens of this country, and we have a civic duty. That's not what I'm saying. But I think where we go wrong is when we place all our hope on the state of our government. Jesus says, that's worship. You're putting all your hope on an empire? And here's the deal. Someone's going to get elected this November, and about half of us will be happy, and about half of us will be angry. And I think it's both idolatry, because the half that are happy are saying, thank God, we're going to be okay because this person's in office. And the other half will be saying, oh God, we're not going to be okay because this person is in office. Both are putting a lot on an empire. And God says, wait, wait, wait. I'm on the throne. I'm on the throne. Stop it. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, Christians or not, if we're not worshiping God, we are going to gravitate to putting all our hope in some type of political empire. And Jesus says it's the number one temptation in Revelation. And this beast that's described will one day end, will one day be destroyed, but God's kingdom will will not. All empires have a shelf life, even our own. Are you with me? We'll see if I get hate emails. Parker, what's your email? (laughs) Parker at ucov.com. He loves hearing these things. But it is interesting that the primary enemy that, that Satan uses is a political empire to get people to worship. So be careful. What number am I at? Nine. Okay, number nine. That in the midst of all this craziness, that you would see Jesus' heart for his people. I just love that in the book of Revelation, you see this loyalty from Jesus for his people. He cares so much for his church. When I say church, I'm not talking about the buildings, I'm talking about the people of God. Oh, he cares. One of the first images of Jesus in all his glory is he's standing amidst seven lampstands that represent the churches. He's not outside the lampstands. He's not above. He's right in the center. It says that he carries in his hand the angels of the churches or the messengers or the leaders of the churches. He is in the midst of his people and he loves them. In the midst of all this uh, horrendous stuff happening to Christians in Revelation, all the martyrdom, you see this picture of Jesus sealing his people and protecting them and watching out for them and giving them a new identity. Brothers and sisters, I hope you know how much Christ loves you. He describes himself as a groom and we are the bride and he keeps pursuing us. He loves us. And even, this is in the time of hardship, this picture of God's commitment to us through Jesus Christ. I hope you know that we follow someone who will never abandon, who will always pursue. And when Jesus sees those who suffer for his name in the book of Revelation, there's always reward. There's this theme of all those who suffer, those who die, those who are persecuted, he keeps saying, hold on, there's a reward on the other end. He cares for us when we take the risk to share our testimony and suffer for it. It just shows over and over again that God is so committed to us, even in the suffering. Amen? All right, number 10. This comes from the final chapters of Revelation. That our hope is not in our good or bad works, but rather that our our name is written in the book of life. There's this picture of Revelation where we're all before the judgment throne, and God pulls out all the books of everything we've done, good and bad. Are you with me? I read that and I go, oh, it's over. I have no hope. It's done. Like, it's over. There's no way. All my thoughts, everything I've ever thought, and you're like, it's, it's over. There's just no way. And then this other book comes out called the Book of Life. And it's like, if you're in the Book of Life, all those books don't matter because Christ has died for you and you've accepted that. So this joy of being in the Book of Life, that we can look forward to that day, that, that Christ's 
rescue of us is fully fulfilled and we don't need to worry because Christ has taken on our suffering. And if you're here today and you've not accepted that gift, please talk to me or one of the pastors. We want you to experience the joy of knowing that we have done good and bad and God has forgiven us. Now we do good because of what he's done, not in order to earn his favor, but because we have been in his favor. And here's number one, 11, that we can look forward to a day when the Lord's prayer will finally be answered. Oh Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for that every day. We pray for that to happen in the here and now, but there will be a day when that prayer is fully answered. In the last two chapters of Revelation, talk about a new heaven and a new earth coming together where God's presence is with us and his will is done. And it's beyond whatever we can imagine. And the best part is we get to see the face of God. In the midst of suffering, this is God caring for his people, that there is a promise ahead. All right, those were the 11 points. I want to conclude with a couple of things. I'm going to ask you to focus on one or two of those points. Let me conclude with this. We've been using a commentary by Daryl Johnson, and he started his commentary by saying this. I read this the first week. I want to read it again. He says, If it ever became illegal in my part of the world to own a complete copy of the Bible, and if the authorities, as an act of mercy, allowed me to possess just one book of the Bible for personal use, he says, I would, without hesitation, keep the last. I would keep the book of Revelation. I am convinced that no other book helps us see Jesus as he is right now, as clearly and as compellingly as the last book that John wrote. No other book helps us see Jesus relative to the movement of history the way the last book does. No other book helps us see Jesus relative to the powers at work in our time the way the last book does. No other book helps us see him in a way that overcomes our fears and frees us for radical faith. And no other book in all of human literature crystallizes what it means to belong and to follow Jesus in this world. Amen. Revelation 1.3, the third verse of this book says this, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart. So brothers and sisters, thank you for walking through this with me. Jesus says, blessed are you just by hearing and taking to heart. Blessed means lucky you. You are so fortunate. Man, the wind is blowing in your favor. This is something about hearing and speaking and taking in this book where God says, well done, well done. Church, as we close, pick your one or two so you apply something from the sermon. And know also as we look ahead, we're gonna be starting a series on friendship next week. In the fall, we're gonna go through the book of Acts. I'm looking forward to what God has for us in his word. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this book. Thank you that you show us, not just tell us, but you give us images to ignite our imaginations, to ignite emotion, to help us see something that we can't comprehend in a way we can see it. Lord, as we said, there's not too much that's new in Revelation. It's just taking so many themes in the previous 65 books, but now showing it to us and letting us hear it. Lord, I pray that you, by your spirit, would shape who we are through your word. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the ways that you have rescued us. And I pray, God, that in the same way you've taken on suffering that we've caused you, that we would do the same for others. And I pray, God, in the ways that you weren't ashamed to speak of us, that we would not be ashamed to speak of you. Lord, help our courage, even when it's costly. And help us remember what is true in the heavenly realms the whole time. We praise in Jesus' name and all God's people say.